Uh, I have, uh, I think you probably have read this in Gonzalez Faust. He had summarized in a way the, the, what we find in the New Testament in regard to configurations of ecclesial ministry. We may be led to believe that uh, when we talk about ecclesial ministry in the Bible, that it is a kind of a uniform kind of a, a appreciation of ministry. In fact, it is very, very diverse, very, very diverse. And so diverse, in fact, that uh, the ensuing generations of Christians mm -hmm. have more or less followed one or two of these uh, configurations, depending, of course, on the, uh, the situation that they are faced with, but also depending on the, uh, the, the emphasis or the point that they would like to emphasize in regard to their following of Jesus, in regard to the discipleship of Jesus. So... <clears throat> For example, we have found in the New Testament a group that would be much more concerned about the adaptation to the situation. And this is what happened in Jerusalem. Of course, understandable because uh, they were still very much rooted in the Jewish faith. So in other words, they were still, they still considered themselves as Jews, but they are different from the regular Jews because they have received already the message of Jesus, and Jesus seemed to have gone beyond simply the Torah or the, the, the prescribed uh, customs of the Jewish people, have gone beyond or have gone even deeper into the uh, religious instinct of, of Israel. So <clears throat> the concern of the Jerusalem community would be how to adapt itself to the situation where the majority, of course, are Jews. In other words, what is the identity of the community uh, within Jerusalem or in, in Jerusalem or in the context of a majoritarian uh, Israelitic uh, community? Now, this wasn't always the same in other places also, as we, as we find that in, uh, in Antioch, this is in Syria, a little bit north of, uh, of Israel. Uh, Antioch would be right around uh, Syria, almost uh, near uh, the present day uh, Lebanon. <clears throat> the concern was much more on missionary creativity. We have a message to, to proclaim, the message from Jesus, and that this particular mission that we have been entrusted with has to be preached has to be carried out in the different places where we go. And so the expansion that we will call the missionary expansion, of course, starting with, uh, with Paul and, and Barnabas, the missionary expansion was some dictated in a way their sense in, uh, in, uh, in its context, how ecclesial ministry was going to be uh, uh, performed. Uh, in that context, in the context of a uh, missionary community. In the Pauline churches, as you have seen, there was a great deal of emphasis on the charism. The charism because <clears throat> uh, Paul already realized that there are many people with different uh, talents and different ways of accepting the message of, of Jesus. And that it seems like there, these different ways have been inspired by the spirit or inspired by their faithfulness to, uh, to the message of Jesus, trying to articulate that message in their own, in their own context. And so there's that kind of a plurality uh, in that is why you find in the, the letters of Paul, in the, in other, in, uh, especially 1 Corinthians, he would be speaking about uh, one community, but so many talents, prophets, kings, servants, etc. okay that all of these are meant to be gifts and charisms at the service, to be used for the service of the community. Okay, so it's a very different kind of a perspective on what the church is going to be like. Whereas in the Johannine communities, their concern was on living as a community of disciples, where the most important thing is that we are all equal. <clears throat> 
And that, of course, as, as, as you know, the, uh, the letters of, of John and as well as the Gospel of John always emphasize the whole idea of love. It is basically love that brings us together and that uh, makes us all equal because we have been loved by God. So the emphasis was not so much on the missionary part that like you would find in Antioch, nor the, the different uh, charisms that are already being uh, received by the members of the community in Pauline churches, but more on how to deepen this relationship that we have first with, with Jesus, but also among ourselves. So uh, the emphasis on fraternal equality. In the pastoral epistles, of course, we have found that uh, there was a bit of crisis already because we know that the pastoral epistles were written a little bit later, much later than the Pauline uh, epistles. And, the, and maybe some, some of the, the earliest gospel like, uh, like Mark, <clears throat> there was already the you know, uh, a burgeoning, in a way, crisis. Uh, and that is the crisis uh, about the <clears throat> use of, or the, the, the usefulness of authority in resolving some critical issues. So, Understandably, again, we find that the pastoral epistles would be emphasizing that the, the sense of order that should be take place, the kind of uh, kind of a hierarchical order that needs to be observed if they were going to live as Christian communities. So <clears throat> the emphasis would be much more on the on the level of order, and we will find that in the ensuing. Uh, uh, decades, not just decades, but centuries, you will find that this uh, became much more the, uh, the perspective or the outlook that many of the early fathers of the church had taken, precisely because they were also facing uh, the, the cr critical situations, such as, of course, the persecution, and eventually, of course, the, uh, uh, the need to, uh, to continue to give witness to the, to the Faith amidst all these uh, this, uh, difficult oppositions that they had uh, experienced. So <clears throat> the need for pastoral, uh, need for authority in the pastoral epistles. But it was clear, <clears throat> I think for all of them, that the Christian community is not going to be the same Jewish community that they had perhaps started in for those who were Jews, or at least for those who were familiar with the Jewish communities in Jerusalem or in, in the rest of Israel. But the Christian community is supposed to be an alternative community, meaning it is an, a community that is unlike the other usual community. Uh, 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 it's an alternative community, not in a sense that it, is, it becomes so, so very much a special community or, a, or a, an enclosed community, but in fact, it is an alternative community because as against the, the Jewish community, the, this community is supposed to reach out to others. It's to be, to be more inclusive. You know, the, the Jewish uh, people tended to be more exclusive. You know, you are a Jew and so we take care of ourselves and we don't, we don't socialize with those who are not Jews. They are, you know, we have seen this in the, uh, the story of Jesus with the Samaritan woman. <clears throat> uh, but, what, what the, this alternative community that has been inspired by Jesus was meant to, uh, <clears throat> to include others or to, to give that kind of message to the whole world. So we speak about the universal salvation, which is greatly emphasized in Luke and in the Acts of the Apostles. But this is the meaning of, of the Christian community being an alternative community. It has a different way of looking at, at things. It's not exclusive, it is much more inclusive. It is not just for the Jews, it's also for the Gentiles and other people who are willing to receive the good news of Jesus. So this was the prominent uh, imperative that the uh, Christian communities had in, in, in uh, spreading itself throughout the uh, different parts of the Roman Empire. So <clears throat> this is a way of summarizing the first two sections of the uh, of our, our chapter. Now we are going to go to uh, <clears throat> the next section from ministry to the bishop. Now, this is about 200 years 
we're talking about well, more give and take 200 years. And as you well know, these are the very, very critical uh, years of uh, the development of Christianity. Very critical because this was the time when, when the ideas were still very fresh from the inspiration of Jesus and, and Pentecost, of course, and Paul, the great, uh, the great preacher, but also the great leaders of the, uh, of the early church were formed during this period. And they were formed because they really had uh, uh, not only a great desire to go deeper, to reflect deeper on their own experience, but because also the situation uh, uh, had forced them to go deeper and really um, make a kind of a, 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 an analysis on what makes them different from the rest of the population in the, in the Roman Empire. So from the point of view of the historical context, we find that uh, <clears throat> here we are talking about the time from the last New Testament books. Generally, we say 90s or about 100 would be the uh, letter of uh, John or that letter of John, but I mean the Revelation. Two, the Constantinian times, which is basically 313 or 315. When you talk about the uh, <clears throat> the Constantinople, I mean Constantine, the Emperor Constantine, uh, recognizing the uh, Christianity as a religion, not yet as an imperial religion, but a religion, nonetheless, a religion that is allowed to be practiced in the Roman Empire. So this is a decisive period for the future of the church. What we find during these 200 years is a period of unprecedented growth in church membership. According to uh, Bernier, it was half a million in 100 CE to 10 million in 300 CE. So it uh, more than, uh, it grew 10 times as many. You talk about 10 million, but compared to 50 million in the Roman Empire, it's only going to be one-fifth of the Roman Empire would be Christians. But that is still something very, very big. But that, mean, that doesn't mean that they were already all accepted. Of course, as we all know, there was a great deal of persecution and in the process, martyrdom. Okay. <clears throat> Some of the Christians were thrown to the den of the lions, uh, especially by Nero. Uh, then Nero was about the, the, the 60s. Uh, that was already the beginning of the persecution of the, uh, uh, the Christians. But throughout the 200 years, there were a lot of persecutions. So there were a lot of martyrs. There were uh, people who, who died for the, uh, for the faith. And that is uh, one reason why the martyrs were so very, uh, were so... Um, had a great reputation because precisely uh, they were witnessing to their faith in a very heroic way. Now, the development also uh, during this time was more towards a, a uniform church structure. I guess they had really an instinct that no matter the persecution, no matter the uh, the uh, what do you call this, the discrimination. It is a foregone conclusion that the Christianity is going to be uh, pretty much the dominant religion all throughout the Roman Empire. And so in a way, they needed to uh, organize in such a way that the structures are not just for limited number of uh, communities, but uh, structures that would be useful for not only for these different communities, but also for the rest of the Roman Empire. In the process, of course, you have the uniformization of church structures. And normally, this is what happens when you start as small communities and only with very few members, you tend to be rather intense in your own, in your own sense of community. When you become very, very big, especially when you become the majority, uh, okay, it's so very difficult to become that small community, very fervent and devout community. 
but you become part of the bigger uh, majority and you become a bigger reality. And what is important there is that there has to be order. Because if there is no order, then it will, what, will, what will come would be chaos. It will be very difficult to rule uh, 10 million people than if you were to talk only about thousands of uh, members of the com communities. You need a much uh, a structure that would cover or that would be useful for the rest for all these uh, 10 million people. Uh, <clears throat> so the development uh, more, was moving towards a, un a more uniform church uh, structures from the Domus Ecclesia, as you will find Ecclesia, we'll find that the, uh, there was this gathering, church gatherings in community, in, in family houses, small communities. Now we are talking about, especially in, in places where Christianity was, was, was very much welcome, there was uh, a gathering of, of many, many more people in, in a bigger place. That is the Aula Ecclesia from house gatherings to large rectangular halls. The large rectangular halls are the, the halls that were used by the Roman Empire for big gatherings. We talk, we talk about 100 or maybe more than 100, 200 people, then you have what you call the rectangular. And that is precisely the, the structure that we have inherited from the Roman Empire, the, what we call the basilical structure, the, the long rectangular structure. Okay. The increase in church loosening of the tight bond in communion of the early Christians. In other words, whereas they were very fervor, uh, they were very fervent you know, as a Christian community, let's say in Jerusalem, in Antioch, in, in Corinth, in Thessalonia, etc. Now that every is a good number of uh, uh, Christians in, in a particular community, for example, let's say in Corinth, then the, the bond that existed among the few people, few first members of the Christian community become a little bit more loose. You don't probably, or they probably would not know each other. Whereas in the previous small and, and well, well and, and tight community, they probably knew each other uh, very well. Here, you are talking now about hundreds of people who, are, who have proclaimed themselves as Christians and who are now more or less belonging to a much larger organization. Thank you. But also because of so many people, then there's the possibility that they could misinterpret some of the teachings. You can imagine when Paul was preaching to small com smaller communities, Paul could do that because he could go from one community to another and be pretty much talk about the same kind of doctrine or teaching. But when you talk about a big, big community where Paul will no longer be able to reach, but or maybe the other apostles or the other people who have heard Paul preach could relate or could uh, uh, translate what he had to say. Of course, there's a possibility that you could not uh, interpret uh, uh, completely uh, what Paul was saying. And so you make your own interpretation. And this was the beginning, of course, of what we would eventually name as heresies, wrong uh, teaching. And this would be continuing because this is the dynamic that exists in the building up of the church, as well as in the deepening of the reflection of the Christian by the Christian community. There were also some cases of the lapsi. Those of you who have taken church history, Already you know that these are the people who have initially become Christians, but then had gone back to their old ways. In other words, they have lapsed. They have gone back to their maybe sinful ways or their, their public uh, ways, because maybe it, it was too rigorous. The, their, their life of Christians was, was too rigorous. Then that created a problem for the leaders of the church. What are we going to do with these people? If they want to come back, for example, they have relapsed and then they wanted to come back, are we going to baptize them again? Or are we going to ask them to do, let's say, uh, what do you call this, uh, uh, re-catechesis under a particular apostle or disciple or instructor for about what, five months, six months? Those are the things that uh, 
they needed to resolve because things like this have, uh, have, have uh, occurred. <clears throat> but among them also, you would have leaders who would emerge from among the successors of the apostles. I put the successors in quotes because this is not really what they, they were talking about, or at least when we talk about the successors of the apostles, the bishops as the successors of the apostles, we're talking about something that would develop still in 200 years time. That's still not the, the, the thinking, but meaning what we mean here would be the leaders who would come after, let's say Paul would preach in Corinth, but he would leave behind certain leaders who would take care of the community in the absence of Paul. So that community, that, that, that person has been authorized by Paul to teach. So therefore, he can be considered as a successor of the apostle in, uh, in, uh, in that sense. But among those people, of course, who became uh, teachers were people who probably were already uh, the intellectual uh, part of the community. In other words, people who belong to the intelligentsia. In other words, people who are educated people who are able to, to reflect or perhaps have studied philosophy or whatever, people who are more or less uh, uh, conversant with, uh, with ideas that were already in, in existence during that time. Remember that the, uh, the Roman Empire had inherited Greek philosophy, Greek philosophies, and so they should be. The intelligentsia were people who really were those who had been familiar who were familiar with these uh, different uh, classical literary writings. Okay. <clears throat> but everyone in the community are called to give witness to Christian ideals. Everyone is called to give witness to the Christian ideals. So no matter the diversity and no matter the, the, um, the, 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 the greatness of the number, in other words, thousands and thousands of people, no matter the same message was being proclaimed, we have to give witness to what Jesus had preached to us. The message of Jesus is what is going to give us the kind of a, a distinctive characteristic that separates us in a way from Now, it was during this time, in the 200 years before the Constantinian era, that we can find the local churches growing. And what do we mean by local churches? We mean, of course, as you would find in the different letters of Paul, to the Corinthians, to the Romans, to the Thessalonians, to the Ephesians, to the Galatians, etc. All of these are local churches. And the local churches were, of course, headed by some leaders. Some of them were direct, what we would call direct descendants from the apostles. Some of them would be two or three generations uh, from the apostles, especially when we're talking about the year 200 or something. Uh, <clears throat> so, but they, they operated as a, as, a, as a church, as a local church. And they had uh, taken on different characteristics. And if you, if you read through the epistles or the, the letters of Paul to these different communities, different local churches, you would find that each one of them was grappling with certain issues. For example, the issues in Jerusalem was the issue about circumcision, let's say, whether that is necessary for those who are not Jews uh, to, to, to go through. When you talk about Corinth, you talk about divisions already. People are fighting among themselves, Christians are fighting among themselves. Of course, the people in Rome, they're talking here about this, the seat of power of the, the Roman Empire and how were they going to behave? How are they going to, uh, to uh, not only behave, but how are they going to continue giving witness to their faith, but at the same time being confronted by hostilities from among the Roman authorities? But the important thing here, here is that local churches are beginning to take on their own particular characteristics. And this is the beginning of what we would call the different rites. You know, the Armenian rites, the Syrian rites, the, uh, the Ethiopian rites or the Coptic rites. These are already starting to, uh, to, to develop 
precisely because they were trying to be faithful to the message of Jesus, but in their own context, which is different from the context, let's say, in Alexandria or in Antioch or in, in, in Corinth, in, in Greece or in Rome. Different. So particular, this is the meaning of the, the local church that, uh, that we find in the early years of Christianity. Okay, a kind of an overview of what developed in the, in the 200 years that we're talking about. There were residential leaders. In other words, unlike uh, Paul, who was an itinerant uh, preacher going from place to place, there were now leaders who resided in a particular place and stayed there. So they were the residential leaders. These were the presbyters or the bishops of the pastoral epistles. And they started to take on more prominent roles. Eventually, with the bishop emerging as the top leader of the local church. So at the end of 200 years, you find that the, the number one minister, to talk about the one who exercises ministry in its fullest sense, is the bishop. Okay. And these residential leaders were replacing the apostles and the prophets in terms of power and influence, because of course the apostles already were dying and the prophets were also being uh, decimated by the persecution. Okay, but they were taking on additional responsibilities. And these responsibilities included presiding at cultic celebrations. So these leaders started out not as cultic leaders, but eventually they would take on some of the cultic responsibilities because they were the leaders of the community. Okay, this is very good, very important for, for us to bear in mind. And very important, especially for the first year, those of you who are in first year theology, for, for important for you to bear in mind because you maybe have the, the impression that uh, the structure that we now have in of, uh, inherited from, let's say, the New Testament or even from the first uh, two centuries of Christianity. Not quite. Not quite. But there is a basis for it in the, uh, in the early Christian communities, especially in the communities of the fathers of the church. And that is the reason why we're taking time to uh, explain this, because this is crucial. It's important for us not to mistake our own structure now, organizational structure now, and try to project that onto the, uh, the experience of the early Christians. I think we should respect the situation of the early Christians and respect the way they had organized themselves according to what they thought was best. Now, how did they become such great leaders of the church? Were they chosen by the community? It started out that way. They were always elected by the community on who becomes the leader. But they were also leaders who had this charism, the gift, you know. They just have the talent to be a leader. That's something that you have to recognize. There's a talent for being a preacher or a teacher. There's a talent for being a, a pastoral worker that was taking care of the, uh, the nitty gritty, like the finances, the uh, alms for the poor, and taking care of the poor and, and the widows, etc. Those are what we would call charisms. But as yet, there was no direct connection to the idea of an ordination. It will come. That whole idea will come, but it is not, uh, it is good to bear in mind that at the beginning of, let's say, the first 100 years or the second one, the was is still at the back, in the background. Okay? So these are the developments in, in ministry. Now, I, I, I want to follow what uh, written in, in, his, in this chapter on uh, the, uh, the bishops becoming the, the, the minister, because uh, we may get the false idea that the fathers of the church spoke a kind of a uniform kind of a language, which is really not the case. We are talking here about a diversity in theological expressions, but diversity in theological perspectives, because 
they have concerns that are quite different one from, from one church to, to, to the other. The case, for example, of Clement of Rome. He issues a letter in 95 CE suggesting that the Christians in Corinth submit to the elders, to the presbyters, against whom the former have rebe rebelled. Okay. So Clement of Rome heard about Corinthians, uh, Cor uh, the Corinthian Christians who were rebelling against the elders. And so he issues a letter and he says, you obey, you try to obey. Okay. And what was his justification for this? He says that the church order, in other words, the role of the elders, the presbyter, was something that was divinely willed because we all have a proper place in the church. The presbyters and the bishops derived their authority from the apostles who appointed them. So if Paul had appointed these elders in Corinth, then you better obey them because their authority comes all the way from Paul himself. Okay. Clement uh, uses the word laicos, but laicos here basically <clears throat> is not in the same sense that we, we speak of the, the laity now, uh, nowadays, but in the, in the most general way, in so far as the laicos are those people who are not leaders. But that's just to make the distinction. Those who are not leaders are part of what we call the laicos. Okay. The Didache, which is a very important uh, source of our information about the teachings of the, uh, the fathers of the church. The Didache speaks of prophets. They are called high priests. Now you have to remember that the expressions we are using here are, are something that is, that are, they are comparative uh, uh, expressions because whether they were called high priests at this time is really something that is uh, debatable but in other words they occupy a certain position of authority especially when it comes to celebrating the Eucharist in other words they were the ones who led the prayers but they were also con considered as prophets because prophetess in Greek is basically to speak and eventually, of course, the connotation is that you are the witness. So if you are the leader appointed by Paul and you are being asked to teach the people there in the say in Corinth or in, in other places, then you have the authority to lead the community. And because you are the leader of the community, you also lead, especially in the prayers, in the breaking of bread. So that is just uh, what they call this. That is uh, uh, the most uh, understandable because you are you are the, the leader. Notice we're not here talking about you are celebrating the Eucharist because you have been ordained. No, that's still several years back. Okay, Ignatius of Antioch <clears throat> was the first one to introduce really the three-tiered leadership ministry, the idea of episcopus. Presbyteros and diaconos. Okay, at least first one to mention the three at one time: the episcopos, the presbyteros, yes. and the diaconos. The episcopos, of course, was the leader. Okay, the leader. And the diaconos is the one who helps the leader. Okay, so the diaconos uh, uh, helps the the leader. Now, <clears throat> Ignatius connects the bishops to Eucharistic presidency, as well as the source of unity for the community. Again, it would be a stretch for us to say that uh, uh, precisely the bishop was uh, presiding at the Eucharistic celebration because he had been ordained, not yet. He presides because he is the leader of the community. And as the leader of the community, he is supposed to preserve or to be the sign of unity for the community. That is the perspective of, of Antioch. Now, where do the presbyteros or the presbyteroi come in? Who are they? Generally, they were considered as the elders or the advisors. 
they were inferior to the bishops, but they were superior to deacons in some instances. Later on, we would see that uh, uh, the deacons started to become more, even more, much higher than the, uh, than the, uh, than the presbyteroi, precisely because from among the deacons were taken the ones who would become priests rather than the, the presbyteroi. Because the presbyteroi were already considered as the council, in other words, the advisors, advisors of, of the Pope. And they have their own particular charism. In other words, they are the ones who are, who are considered as wise people, who probably have enough experience or maybe had given enough witness that they are able to be considered as authorities. They are authorities. They are the ones who, who know something about the, the situation. Or maybe they are the ones who would be able to solve issues and problems. Okay. Now, with, uh, with this three-tier leadership, succession became a vital concern. Okay. You, you, cannot, you cannot take it away. You cannot, you cannot, uh, you cannot have an ordered uh, kind of a community without worrying about who is going to be the next leader. Who is going to be the next leader? So the one closest to the bishop, the one closest to the bishop is the deacon. Or should we get the, the, the leader from among the presbyteroi? Maybe, maybe. But if the, uh, the deacon has been uh, delegated by the bishop to do so many things that he could not do, then what, why, why not uh, appoint the deacon? So this is, these are uh, some of the the issues that they had to confront uh, because we are talking about leaders who want a limited number of years. Some of them eventually would be, would be martyred because they were the leaders and the uh, Roman authorities would think that if they were to kill the, kill the leaders, then they would suppress the community. Of course, there will be other leaders. Okay. Now, again, the important thing to bear in mind is that every church the church community has a say on who are the candidates and who should be elected as the leader. So in, in a way, we can, we're talking about a very democratic kind of a, a setup, an organization, because it is the community that decides who becomes uh, the leader. Okay. Now, <clears throat> who becomes the leader? What qualities do we expect the leader to have? Well, in the context of Ignatius of Antioch, he would be looking for someone who would be in line with the teaching of the apostles or with Paul or the other apostles. In other words, that they would not be contradicting uh, Paul in, in his teaching. So in other words, you are here talking about right teaching, that they teach the right things. And this is what is meant by orthodoxy, the right teaching. And many times the right teaching means teaching that comes all the way from the apostles. Which means you have to have a record of this teaching. And it comes in the form of letters, in the form of discourses, short discourses. We are lucky to have Paul, for example, because he had written extensively. And that's why we have a lot of the letters of Paul. And in these letters, we get to know more or less what was happening in that particular uh, community, let's say in Corinth, in Ephesus, in Thessalonia, etc. Now, the prophet, who was basically a teacher, we now have the, the prophet would become would would morph into the uh, the role of the bishops. The prophets were very well respected; they were respected leaders. Of course, not everybody is considered a prophet. That's why there are few of them. And because there are few of them, they are select few. And if they are select few, that means that those who are, who are considered as prophets exercise a great deal of influence and power. Okay. The Shepherd of Hermas, for example, is a document. Uh, testify to their existence side by side with the apostles, bishops, teachers, presbyters, or deacons in a sort of corporate leadership meant to nurture the community's life 
and guide it properly. What is that noise I am, I am hearing? Okay. All right. So the prophets would become a bishop eventually, but the prophets started out as a charism, as a gift which a particular person probably had. He was a good teacher. He's a wise person. Okay. But it doesn't mean that he's also at the same time the bishop. No. It could be different, different persons. But this kind of leadership, the, the leadership of the prophet, the leadership of the bishop work was, work was considered as maybe parallel leadership. So you, you are talking here about leadership that is accepted by the community as valid. They're both valid. There's one for order and there's one for teaching. It's a valid kind of a, a distinction, parallel leadership. So... But the head was the bishop. And soon, the other roles, the other charisms faded in terms of power and influence. In other words, there were times when the prophet was the big teacher, and then they were looking for a bishop, a leader. Then eventually they just decided, why don't we just choose this prophet to be our leader? And he was also chosen as the leader. And when he becomes the leader, of course, Many of the other charisms that were, as I said at the beginning, parallel uh, uh, leaders, uh, parallel, parallel leadership structures, uh, eventually came to be uh, fused with the role of the, the bishop. So there was a kind of what we call episcopal centralization. Now, the primary leader would become the bishop. Yes, he may have a prophetic uh, gift, or he may have another kind of a gift, but he is also at the same time the leader. Okay. Now, in regard to the leader as a pastor, this is much more the idea that we have now of, of bishop. Bishop as the pastor, the chief uh, shepherd, the chief shepherd of the community. He is the head of one community, and he was much closer to his people. So when the Pope, for example, says that a leader or a minister is supposed to know, he should be like a, like a shepherd who would know the smell of his sheep. Okay. This is the image that, he, that Pope Francis was trying to, to draw from. The bishop as the pastor who would be close to his people, very close to his people. He would know them by heart and by smell. Okay, because often he was chosen by them. Okay, and because you were chosen by them, the people felt confident approaching this, this particular leader. But eventually, of course, we could not avoid it. Strong leaders would come and they would take on the bishop's role. And maybe some members of the community would say, Yeah, he's a strong leader. Let's we, we need a strong leader at this particular point because we are also divided we need somebody who should be able to tell us this is what you need to do so but of course strong leaders sometimes tend to dominate others and so when a strong leader would dominate other ministers all the least small charisms that were legitimate that were valid charisms from the holy spirit would fade into the background because the leader is the one that is exercising the influence. And that leader happened to be the bishop. And especially when you are celebrating the Eucharist or presiding at the Eucharist, then you are prominently positioned to become the main leader. Again, the role is always to maintain unity in the body of Christ. A threat to this, of course, false teaching and sin. Okay. Uh, of course, not all leaders became very, uh, very exemplary. There were some, of course, leaders who had their own failings, who had their own imperfections. And, and of course, well, what should the community do? Should the community replace these, these leaders? There were instances when the community decided yes, we remove him. He's no longer the leader. Now, 
The bishop's role eventually expanded towards not only the unity of belief, but also purity of life. In other words, this is our faith. This is what we believe in. Anybody who believes outside of this or contrary to this will not be a member of the community. And the bishop was the one who would enforce that, who would say this is true and this is not true. When, the, uh, when there were so many, the number of Christians started to grow exponentially, uh, the bishop would insist on a purity of life. Let's go back to the, the, the teaching of Jesus and let's try to live that kind of uh, life. Fortunately, there, are, there were many very good bishops during, during this time and very good teachers at that. Now, the question about the bishop as the liturgical leader and presider. In this 200 years, within these 200 years, it was clear that the bishop presided at at least four celebrations, baptism, Eucharist, ordination, and penance. Okay, baptism. Oh, you mean to say that there were, the deacons could not baptize? We're talking here about people who are being admitted into the community. And this was very gradual. There were only a few people who were being admitted. And the, the one to admit them, of course, is the, the leader of the community. And who is the leader of the community? It's the bishop. Also, he was presider of the Eucharist, what we would call the prayer meeting uh, or the breaking of bread. Okay. You have the liturgy of the word, listening to the letters or inspiring words from, let's say, the apostles, the apostles Peter and, and Paul, or eventually the, the gospels, uh, listening, to, listening to them. And then, of course, uh, uh, leading in the uh, breaking of the bread. There's also ordination. The ordination here we're talking about is when <clears throat> he's the leader in, in the process of appointing somebody as a leader, either in a particular community or in a particular, what we would call local church. A bishop uh, a bishop can be consulted by other bishops in the appointment of a particular person in a, in a given uh, church, in a given local church. So this is the meaning of ordination here. We're not yet talking about the, the liturgical ordination per se. <clears throat> and of course, in the sacrament of penance, we're talking here about the lapsi, those who are, have lapsed, the, the heretics. If they would like to come back, it is the bishop who authorizes them, who gives them, or who welcomes them back, and who imposes penance, what they have to do. So it's the bishop who would say, okay, if you want to come back, you have to do fasting for every Friday. You have to do fasting for the next, let's say, five months. It's the bishop who makes that kind of a, a regulation. So in, in four of those, in, four, in those four occasions, the bishop is the presider. In some instances, like in initiation rituals in baptism uh, <clears throat> or the presiding at the Eucharist, other ministers were given responsibilities, but they were always delegated responsibilities. So the bishop can always say, you, the presbyter will say, you do this particular part of the, the Eucharist celebration. You, the deacon, you do this particular uh, part. Eventually, you, you would come into the, the role of the deacon as the proclaimer of the gospel and the role of the uh, what is this, the, uh, the, the presbyteroi, uh, as members of the concelebrating team. Okay. So the bishop assigns penance and reconciles penitent with the church. So that is as far as liturgical precedency is concerned. Again, I want to emphasize we're not here talking about ordination yet. But the bishop is also considered as an administrator, or a supervisor. Episcopos basically means an overseer. Episcopos. So the bishop as the episcopos means that he is supervising a community. He is the administrator in a particular district. So more members meant more centralized administration because of a few number of ministers. There were not too many bishops. There were not too many presbyters. 
But in every community, there was always a group of advisors, what we call the elders, as well as deacons. In Rome, there were seven uh, deacons because the seven deacons were in charge of the seven districts of, uh, of Rome. The supervision eventually gave way to ruling. I supervise you. So in other words, I really do not have authority over you, but I have been entrusted to, to make sure that there is proper order, so I'm going to do that. That's the role of the supervisor. Eventually, it will graduate into something much stronger. I rule over you. You follow what I have to say, especially if the leader happens to be a strong leader. So it's similar to what they would have in the Roman structure or organizational structure. The Didascalia Apostolorum, another source book, speaks of an almost divine person, regal, supreme judge with powers from God, but also protector of poor and widows. Here you already see the beginning of the monarchical episcopacy. A, a, a bishop, the episcopacy that is more, that is similar to a king similar to a king. And especially when the Didascalia Apostolorum would speak about uh, the person having divine, divine uh, prerogative. And he is almost like the regal or the supreme judge. We need also to bear in mind that as I have told you, some of the leaders that were chosen during this time came from prominent families or probably were the the intellectual elite in the, during their own play, in their own times. Maybe they were the judges. And so it is just, again, inevitable that the same person would be given that kind of a responsibility as the bishop when they, be, when they converted to Christianity. They were given that role as a bishop because they already had a kind of a, a, a power or, or an authority, a sense of authority or an air of authority among themselves. In other words, they were already recognized as leaders in, their, in, in the secular organization. So, <clears throat> but of course, the whole idea that as a leader in the Christian community, they have to take care of the poor and the widows. Uh, 